Hey everybody, welcome to part 7 of my Wild Love Between the Barry to Me White Walls section. I know it's been a while since part 6, but we're here. As usual, there's going to be some links in the description so that way you can skip around to different parts of the video. It's going to be a long video as usual. If this is the first video that you're watching in the series, I suggest you start from the beginning just because I reference earlier videos and a lot of times I've already spoken about certain things so you might have some questions as to why I'm tuned a certain way or why I'm talking about this progression that sounds foreign and I'm not explaining it. There's also a link in the description that has an interview that Paul recently did. Um, Paul starts talking about how he thinks of riffs as chords and kind of like harmonic progressions. So I think that's really cool that I'm doing harmonic progression analysis and he kind of thinks of things in that way. He also says E minor while he strums the classic E minor cowboy chord. Um, I think that's pretty cool because he's not tuned in E standard, but he's thinking of the instrument in E. I didn't know that that's how he thought of it, but that's how I've been thinking about it this whole series. So that's pretty cool to see him say that and that I'm on the right track. In this video, we're picking up where we left off with that Viridian section that was happening at around the six minute and 54 mark. That's gonna build up into this really cool groovy riff section that's somewhat familiar. Then we're gonna get this really big epic chorus-like section with some clean vocals. And then we're gonna finish off with this techie brutal type of thing. Anyways, here's the playthrough. Okay, so we're coming from that Viridian section that's doing a great job of building things up. We get these volume swells that happen every four or so measures. That really helps to add this cool atmospheric touch. It's tough to tell whether it's only the synth or if it alternates, combines with the guitar. Uh, Dusty can be seen doing the swells on the Colors Live DVD. Either way, I don't think they really affect the chord progression, but they're a great atmospheric touch that lets you know that things are building and something's gonna go down. The drum beats also start to evolve once the bass comes in with its cool little riff that helps the section build up even more. The bass part also helps to define the chord progression that the guitar is playing. 
I see the first two measures as implying an E minor 9. We have E, G, B, and F sharp, which is the ninth in the guitars, and the bass uses the D, which is the minor 7, twice. Because each measure has groupings of 5 and 3 instead of 4 and 4, we could also see these measures as 2.5 beats of E minor 9 and 1.5 beats of G major 7, which is an E minor 9 chord without the root. I use C major 9 over E because of the emphasis of C and the use of D in the bass. D shows up twice again and E is our lowest note. I have G major 9 for the second part of the measure because of that G major 7 arpeggio that's going on in the guitar and the A that appears in the bass part. The notes of the G major 9 are on offbeats, so I don't think it's that important. In the last measure, I'm using A minor 9 over E because of the use of C, A, and B in the guitar parts. The bass doesn't feature an A, but it's ringing out in the guitar part, so I feel like it's pretty important. I didn't give this measure a second chord name for the last one and a half beats because I think it's all one chord. The four chord, which we've used before to go back to the E minor, I also didn't list a function for the D note that's happening in the bass because I believe it's used to follow that motif that's been defined in the previous measures by using a whole step to end the measure. So basically we're going to end up with a reduction that sounds kind of like this. The other cool thing about this bass part is that it references the intro's 16th note riff. I've reduced the riff down to 8th notes, and if we remove some of the notes to get it down to 8 notes, we get the bass line in the first two measures. This motif is further developed into the bass part that we just looked at. The whispering lyrics are pretty cool too, and aid in that buildup that's happening here. There's also this modulation effect going on here, maybe like a phaser flange kind of thing, I'm not really sure. The vocals follow a strict half note rhythm that repeats throughout this section until a second voice comes in screaming, it's all the same, that leads into the next section. I think it's pretty cool that the screaming vocals, which introduce something different, are saying it's all the same after the constant half note based vocals. Another cool thing to note here is that there's a crescendo happening in these vocals that kind of mimic the volume swells that we've been experiencing, almost like the volume swells were a foreshadowing type of thing. We then go into a section that references our double 16th note rip from the intro again, except now it's straight 8th notes and there's no doubling. So we've gone from the Viridian part into the intro riff all over again, but now with a slight twist. We now have an additional 5-4 turnaround measure thing that's going to happen in the last measure. This measure doesn't come out in the original doubled version, but if it did, it would sound something like this. Either way, we end up going from a riff that mostly focused on E minor to one that now includes a C or A minor 7 chord with an E in the bass because we get E's, C's, a G, and now an A. The bass basically doubles this figure, so we can't tell for sure if it's a 6 or a minor 4 chord, but they basically serve the same function. I'm leaning towards calling it an A minor because of what happens later on in the piece. This also mimics the E minor to a C, A minor kind of thing that was happening earlier in the track. After a couple of repeats, we then go into Dusty's tasty lead. I've seen Dusty play it different ways live, and I think it's pretty cool that he kind of improvises with the fingering a bit. This lead not only supports the harmony well, but also helps to clarify what's happening in the harmonic progression. The first two measures vary slightly with each repeat of the solo, but they both help to support the focus on E minor, with the exception of a few neighbor tones. We do get a C note, which I label as an appoggiatura, that stretches over the bar line and is held for a beat and a half. This can be seen as establishing that E minor E aeolian context for the line, because it's a C natural. The repeated version is slightly different, but serves the same function. We get a lower octave on this repeat. Either way, both versions end on an E with some tasty vibrato. In the ending bars, we see the return of the importance of the sixth interval, which we looked at back in part six of the series. Some of that good old southern charm creeps right back in. 
In a similar way, this bar is harmonized in thirds and helps define the last measure of the rhythm guitars that we were looking at. I have some chord names in each screenshot to describe the implied chords for each isolated melody. When we combine the two tracks, we get some triads. The first beat of the measure gives us an A, C, and E in both leads, giving us an A minor triad. The next three eighth notes give us a G major, which is G, B, and D. We then go through a passing tone and end with a B and a G. Now when we look at everything, we have more information to use to define the harmonic progression. The first beat implies an A minor that we said earlier. After that, things get a little weird. The melody makes it sound like we're dealing with groups of descending eighth notes, but our earlier harmonic analysis viewed it as two eighth notes representing a chord and the rest of the eighth notes representing another. The rhythm part seems to be pretty straightforward in 5-4 and contrasts the groupings of the melody. When viewed together, this is what makes the most sense to me. I see the next beat as a C major 9 chord. A minor to C major 7 isn't too weird. This just takes it up a notch. The B and D are accented, so I feel like they're important. So I view them as the 7th and the 9th, respectfully. Beat 3 shows a regular G major chord. Originally, we saw the following eighth notes as a passing tone, and I still think that's fair, but we could also view it as the beginning of an A minor 9 chord. The last two beats are pretty clear C major 7, but if that previous note A was included, we would have an A minor 9. We can also see this measure as A minor for the first beat and C major 9 for the remainder because C major 9 includes all of the notes in the G major triad, and the A minor 9 is on a weak beat. Either way, all this supports the original analysis of A minor, C, and what I actually hear is an ostinato type thing in the rhythm guitars, and this new melody is just a harmonized solo over it. But we can see individual chords if we really want to. After Dusty's melody, the band goes into a riffy power chord version of the riff that they've been playing. <laughs> This really helps to give that big wall of sound effect after only playing single note lines. We see the use of those BT bam power chords with the fifth and the bass, but I didn't write the inversion of the chord names because it was starting to look really cluttered. I'm sure you'll understand. When comparing it to the eight note riff, we see that the D up to A movement is now reversed with the D now going down to A. We also get a C and D power chord towards the end of the first two measures. Everything here still feels like it's hovering over an E minor tonality to me, though. The C and D at the end can also be seen as continuing a walk up from B to E. Like I previously mentioned, the last measure has a C major, A minor kind of function. In this version of the riff, we get a bunch of these C inverted power chords. So the measure is now functioning as C instead of A minor. Again, this measure ends on a D, which helps it walk up to E minor. So that would give us a reduction that sounds something like this. I feel like we should talk about the lyrics a bit more. We get our first huge, catchy, almost chorus-like vocals of the song, all of this over the cool, groovy part. This is the last big chorus-like moment of the album, and it's cleanly sung. What a statement to emphasize clearly, leaving behind something of artistic integrity that will outlive the band. We then get to a cool, chromatically descending phrase that emphasizes a 5 to 1 relationship in two 6-8 bars. <laughs> The first three eighth notes show a 5 to 1 relationship with the D eventually leading to a G. This phrase then repeats three times, descending chromatically by half step each time, and eventually leading us back to E minor. What's interesting about this phrase is that middle A flat power chord. A flat is a tritone, a flat 5 away from D. 
which is a fifth away from G. We've used the flat 5 to 1 progression earlier in the song, and the way it's used here is pretty cool. Not only is it a 1 to flat 5 in the key of D, but the A flat is also a half step above G. We've also previously seen the power of the half step in terms of chord resolutions. We're combining three different harmonic devices that the song has previously used, all in two measures. This isn't mindless chromaticism. Each chord has a push-pull that kind of makes this transition even more effective. The chromatically descending phrase helps to bridge the groovy melodic section that was happening to this new tech-heavy section. We start off with a cool nod at a previous section in the track that we covered in part 4. Looking at the differences between the section in part 4 and this current section, you're going to see two important differences. The first thing that I want to mention is that I'm now writing an inverted B power chord instead of the F sharp power chord from part 4. It's tough for me to decipher, but I want to say they're using the uh, inverted B power chord both times. The second one that I want to address is the quarter note rest from part 4 section. In our current section, this rest is replaced with two eighth notes. In part 4, I talked about the use of altered dominant on downbeats, and here we continue with the D power chord on the downbeat of beat 4. I know A isn't an E altered dominant, but we can make the case that in rock genres, power chords that should be diminished are usually played with perfect fifths. We could also make the case for this section being in Phrygian because of the Fs and G naturals. I'm leaning towards Phrygian this time because there are no B flats and A flat is only a chromatic element, but we can make the same power chord argument for rock genres that we just made. These last two eighth notes set up the next measure perfectly. In the next two measures, we start off by backpedaling from our previous two eighth notes. Notice that we're starting on an upbeat. We still have chords from E Phrygian on downbeats, except for the last beats in each measure. Looking at the first measure, we end on an F sharp fully diminished 7 chord, which we've used before to go back to E in other sections. So even though it's not in Phrygian or altered, we can still use it at any time to go back to E, kind of like a secondary dominant. In the second measure, we start in upbeats again, but as you can see, I labeled the C power chord. If we want to make a case for altered, we can ignore the inverted B power chord on beat 2 and see it all as altered. The B can also be seen as a chromatic half-step tool like we've been using in this section, like the D-sharp, D-flat, C-sharp power chords we've been using. This also really helps with seeing that last beat as an A-flat, flat-5 power chord. If we want to see it as Phrygian, the B power chord works well with our power chords are in perfect fifths in rock music defense that we've been mentioning. One last thing about the A-flat, flat-5 power chord before we move on. This could also be functioning as an implied D diminished triad without the third. The only reason I mention this is because I believe the next measure implies a D minor, and the A flat to A movement would be some pretty cool voice leading by half step. Anyways, this next tapping bit is even crazier to understand. It's obviously really fast, and it was very difficult for me to figure out. So I saw a bunch of different live videos, the colors live shows, and I got a pretty decent uh, angle of Paul playing the tapping phrase. I'm not too sure about the other parts, but I think this is close. You'll see in my conductor score thing that there are a bunch of note names everywhere. I just wanted to show my thought process as clearly as I could. First, let's look at the guitar parts. The lower guitar part starts on A, and the higher guitar part starts on C. These two parts are harmonized in minor thirds, so I would assume there's some kind of effort to create some triad-based harmony. Even though these are mostly 16th notes, they're divided into what is mostly three-note phrases that descend chromatically. So here's an example of what I mean. This is important because if we take a quick look at the bass part, we see two quarter notes. This means the guitar and bass are not lined up in terms of phrasing. 
Going back to the two guitar parts, we do see an incomplete phrase of two 16th notes towards the end of beat two. This helps the guitars and bass line up for beat three. I said the last two 16th notes were part of an incomplete phrase because beat three shows us the complete phrase, which descends again by half step. Now those note names that I have were my initial thought process before including the bass parts. The top part shows what I would have thought about it if we looked at the two guitar parts strictly with strong and weak beats. Kind of implying a D minor 7, B flat minor, A minor 7 kind of thing. The middle line shows my thought process considering three note phrases. D minor 7, C sharp minor 7, A minor 7, G sharp minor 7. As I said before, the bass doesn't line up with the guitar parts, so when I finally took that into consideration, I got weird implied chords with my two previous ways of thinking. I believe the progression written over the bass part makes the most sense. The two chord notes make me want to analyze the first two beats as a big D minor chord. The chromatically descended notes starting from B in the guitar part are kind of like a passing tone phrase. The bass is also playing the root and fifth of a D minor chord. Also, both guitar parts previously implied a D minor, so this isn't too far-fetched. The same way I'm ignoring the offbeats and the middle of the three note phrases for the two previous chord analysis, I'm ignoring the chromatically descended phrase. All that's left is those last two pairs of 16th notes from the incomplete phrase. I see these two pairs as anticipating beat three, so I ignored them. Doing this makes the guitars and bass all line up nicely in beat 3 for an A minor chord that the guitar is anticipated with C and A notes. The bass now mimics the anticipations from the guitars with the D sharp and A. The D sharp is in the implied G sharp minor 7 chord, and the A is on an offbeat and a half step above G sharp, so I ignored it. I'm saying G sharp minor 7 because of the 3 note phrase from the guitars. The G sharp minor 7 then leads us to a C power chord. The G sharp minor 7 is the harmonic equivalent of an A flat minor 7, and A flat minor is a chromatic median submedian relationship with C. In hindsight, I should have labeled it as an A flat minor 7, but either way they function similarly, and you can see that in the half step movement here for G sharp minor 7 also. Here are E Phrygian altered emphasis returns on the downbeats with a 5 4 measure. We then end on an F sharp fully diminished 7 chord, which is implied by the two guitar parts, which we stated before resolves back to E, and it does with the repeat. I'm calling it F sharp fully diminished 7 because of how we've previously seen this chord in the past, and on the last repeat we get a 16th note E chug followed by a C flat 5 power chord, which is also an inverted F sharp flat 5 power chord. If we include the E, we get F sharp, C, and E an F sharp fully diminished 7th chord without the 3rd, which is A natural in the key of E minor. We end up with a reduction that sounds something like this. Tommy's lyrics over this heavy text section are we will be remembered for this. Another epic statement dealing with artistry and mortality. There's a cool repeat echo call and response like part in the vocals on the third and fourth repeats. These aren't the final lyrics of the song though. We'll go into that next time. Well that's it for this episode. I'm glad to get back to the series after a really long break. I know it took a long time from the past episode. Just things got crazy with school and the move. This is the first video in our new house. I'm hoping to get a few more videos in before the semester goes into full swing. Anyways, please comment, subscribe, do the thumbs up thing, all that social media jazz. Please let me know of any suggestions or corrections that you guys have with this video or any of the previous videos or videos that you want me to do in the future. Uh, let me know if there's things that I'm doing that you like in particular. 
I got my social media profiles in the description. I got my Facebook, Instagram, Untap profiles. I have a new Instagram that's public now, so if you guys could like the public version instead of my old one, there's some additional information and additional videos, pictures, and random stuff on the public one that I don't do on my private one anymore. So if you like the old one, if you could follow this new one, that'd be really cool. Until next time, see ya.